actually offers the idea, what we came to realize is that uh, in the application security world, people tend to, they like attacking, breaking things very much. And if you go to a, a typical application security conference, you'll find many talks where people talk about how to break this side or that side or that technology. But very few people actually uh, like to talk about uh, preventing problems and solving problems. And this is a situation that's similar to broccoli, because broccoli, everyone basically knows that broccoli is uh, good for you, but really no one really wants to talk about it, and, and because it's not very interesting. So it's the same with, with, uh, with what we do. Um, just, uh, I'm sure you know, I'm not going to spend, um, you know, very, very well. Um, but I'm very well known these days for working on my security, which is the open source verification firewall. Um, I'm also involved with various uh, application security communities, such as OASP. I run the London chapter. I'm also involved with the Verification Security Consortium. And I, uh, we both work for Bridge Security, as you, as you very well know. And uh, I'm here in my open source capacity uh, here, here today. Uh, the thing is that this particular project is about uh, learning and creating application security models out of applications. And it's also a, it's an interesting fact because internally with the Bridge Security, we've spent years developing just that. Our commercial product web defense was built from the ground up with learning in mind. And what I'm doing here, this is actually my personal journey. Uh, because most security, as you will learn later on, is a very good product. It allows you to do anything uh, that you want, uh, I'll provide a lot of functionality to verification files, however it doesn't do uh, policy security. So what profiler is about making a learning so solution available to open source users, because if you look at the open source landscape, there isn't anything like this, uh, available. So um, in the first part, I'm going to spend some time talking about the problem domain, what we have to deal with, then I'll briefly, just very briefly, introduce mod security because mod profiler actually builds on top of mod security. And then, in the, in the last part, I'm going to talk about what we've done so far and what we're going to do in the short future. So the thing is, as you very well know, that web applications today are inherently secure, and that's because we probably have anywhere from 20 to 30 different stakeholders that are each all contributing their own small part of the. The, the entire ecosystem, you have browsers, you have various plugins such as Flash, Java, uh, PDF, QuickTime, then you have databases in the back end, and really no one has any kind of idea what's going on and how, this, how all these things work. And that's why we are suffering all these problems. And what we came to realize now is that um, uh, we are now in a bit of trouble because criminals are starting to exploit all those security weaknesses. Uh, and because verifications uh, are, are everywhere, we actually have a bit of a, uh, it, it's actually quite a big problem. And as an additional special problem, you will find that most verifications are, are written, are bespoke, and are custom written for particular uh, users' needs. So each verification is actually unique, which makes it, uh, uh, unlike in the, say, network security space, but more, most applications are actually the same. Protecting web applications is, uh, is really more difficult. And again, as you were, well know, we, we are doing different things uh, to sort these problems out. We are investing heavily into educating developers, hoping that, that that will eventually lead to them producing better code. We are also investing a lot into penetration testing, uh, source code reading, and we are also investing a lot into web application files. 
Now, there's a lot of controversy about world creation powers um, because, in a sense, you could say that they're competing with all these other efforts. Uh, my personal view of this matter is that world creation powers are, are an operational tool. They are not, to, not a tool that you use while you develop your software or anything else. But once you, the software is developed, you have to put it into use, and then you, you, you basically take the software and give it to the operations. Um, give it to the people who need to take care of it. And they are the people that need the world education powers because they need to, to know what's going on in the system. And without a, a tool that actually monitors uh, HTTP traffic in real time, you have no idea what is going on in, in your system. Um, so that's what I focused for most of my life by working on security, I focused on well education powers because I believe there's a very small investment to make and then it gives you, uh, uh, gives you great benefits because once you deploy an, a tool that applies security externally um, to the application, you can actually uh, protect all applications at once. In fact, in my case, the, the how I started more security is that I was, uh, I was a technical director of a software development company and I was in charge of making sure that, the, the, that we develop applications, but also that they are secure. And I knew that our applications were, were as secure as I wanted them to be, and I needed something to help me. So that's how, how I started to work on mod security, because I wanted to sleep better at night. Um, so the, the, the challenge is, now we go back to, now, uh, to well, application files and um, how each application is unique. And basically, there are two approaches that the web application powers take. One is a negative security model, and the other is a positive, positive security model. And um, in, in most cases, you, what we need to have is these two models working in balance. In the negative security model, you actively look for negative things in the application traffic. And you know that you have SQL injection uh, attacks, for example, and you will look for pa certain patterns that signify SQL injection attacks. And if you see such a pattern, then you can warn, you can block the traffic, and so on and so forth. Um, the, this is a problem. This is very easy to do, by the way, and we are, we are doing just that. Um, however, the problem is that you are trying to enumerate all the badness that's out there, and that's an enormous job to do. And you are, you're, you're always playing catching up with the bad guys because they keep inventing new things that they're, that they're deploying, and so it's a never-ending game. Um, the alternative is to use the positive security model where you're doing something completely opposite. You don't really care what's, what all, what's all the bad stuff that's out there. You don't really want to know about it. But you just look at your data, you look at your application, and you want to know what's right. So if you have an application that um, has a parameter that's a number, in, in a positive security model, you only care that what you receive is a number. If it's not a number, then you don't care. You can safely reject that transaction. The advantage of a positive security model is that really you don't have to know anything about the attacks. You just focus on what's good for you. You accept. Uh, you accept that. And as a consequence, you will have rejected all of these uh, these attacks as well. Um, so I will give you a, an example uh, why how positive security. Uh, the, the positive security, why positive security is superior, and the, I'm using, going to use the classical SQL injection attack. Um, and if you, in many SQL injection attacks, you will find a pattern one equals one, because that devalues to two, and that is sometimes uh, needed in order, for the, in order for certain things to happen in, in, the, in the SQL itself. So detecting one equals one is easy. Uh, and most IDSs as well as the issue power will do that. However, the problem starts when uh, the attackers start to be creative and they start to do various things, such as using uh, various encodings uh, to hide the track. So they can uh, encode the equal sign using percentage 3 3 And then they can do other things, such as uh, play with white space, uh, mix um, various white, white space uh, characters with different encodings. And then can, they can use tricks such as this one, where you can see that they actually they can embed a comment in between the first one and the equal sign. And basically what happens is that 
the attack string is interpreted by the backend uh, uh, database, and the backend database will uh, happily remove that comment, and then again it will evaluate to one equals one. The problem that what kind of application follows have is that they, they don't really know for each particular equal string. They don't know where this thing is going to end up in. So it may go into a database, but on the other hand, it may not. So we don't know all what are the all possible combinations and transformations and encodings that can apply to every input thing. So, and we can try to cope with the evasion, and that's absolutely fine, but in this particular case, it's simply impossible because what we, look, if you go back, the attacker simply wants to have something that divides the two. So evading and going exactly this way is not necessarily the best path for them. They can use things such as one plus one equals two, equals two, which is also true. They can use things such as two is greater than one, or they can use, in some databases, they can just put one as, the, as a single digit one, and that will, that will allow it is true. So there is no way that we can go and uh, using a negative security model, go into, into that and try to figure out the text that, that uh, uh, particular part. So what we do instead in a positive security model, we say, okay, we have this parameter. Um, and uh, in, in this example here, I have a parameter username. And um, if, if you can read this, this is a more security in the, the fragment that will actually look at one particular script called login.php. And it will only look at the parameter called username. It will, it will make sure that username is a word. So that basically, basically means that you, it, it, the, the username will be able to uh, contain alphanumeric characters, and that's about it. So if you try to do any of this, that will fail. And this is why positive security model is, uh, is, so, 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 is superior to neg the negative security model. However, and now I've told you this story about the negative security model versus the positive security model. And normally the question is why isn't everyone using the positive security model? And the problem is that there's a catch and that uh, the models, someone needs to build them. And because every application is unique, you can't really have uh, pre-built positive security models. With negative security you can, but positive security you can't. So in general, there's a challenge in how do you build these models and more importantly, how do you maintain them over time? Because applications change over time. So who is going to be, even if you build it manually the first time, who is going to maintain this model uh, over time as, uh, uh, as uh, um, the, 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 the application evolves? Um, we're going to make a brief, just a very brief uh, break and I'm going to talk about uh, mod security. Um, the way we built Mod Profiler, we just uh, used, as one of our users has put it, the Mod Security Rule Language, which is the language in which we write rules, it kind of sort of is similar to Assembler. It's very primitive, it, it does its job, but it's, it's a very low level uh, rule language. So what we've done with, with Mod Profiler, we've built a high level logic and then we've, we end up producing more security rules, which are low level, uh, low level stuff. So, that's why it's important to mention about security. Um, most security uh, started to work in 2002 uh, by the virtue that it's free and uh, freely available and it actually works and works, it's well documented. By now it's the most widely deployed web application firewall. You can run it either embedded in the Apache web server or you can run it as a network gateway so you can have a, a kind of proper web application firewall. And we are probably going to have it running in another web service, service in, in, in uh, early 2009. Uh, so our philosophy uh, basically has always been with more security that nothing is done um, implicitly. Uh, more security provides no protection when you install it. And uh, the idea is that you, you have to tell it exactly what you want to do. On the, on the positive side, more security is capable and actually allows you to do pretty much anything that you want to do with graphic. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple programming language that allows you to slice and dice HTTP. So you can take any part of the traffic, you can transform it, you can perform various transformations, look at it in any way that you see fit, and then you can make your decisions what to do with it. You don't have to block, you can warn, you can uh, use the anomaly approach, you can use whatever you, 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 you feel like. Basically, our, our idea is that we want the power to be, uh, in the first instance, we've always 
uh, I've built more security for myself. And uh, in, the, in a sense, for the people who understand uh, application security very well. Uh, the challenge is how do you help these other people who are not application security experts, and how do you help the, those who don't necessarily have the time to spend uh, to becoming application security experts? And that's how Mod Profiler was born. What we want to do is we want to uh, have uh, uh, users supply Mod Profiler to their traffic and help, help Mod Profiler help them by creating this positive security model uh, that will help them increase security of, uh, of, of their products. Um, so uh, one major uh, philosophy point of more security is that complex, ta uh, complex tasks are, are possible. So most, most common tax tasks are very easy to do, but common ta uh, complex tasks are possible. In the latest more security, we even have a full-blown programming language built into it, so you can, uh, you can implement any, pretty much anything that you, uh, that you want. Now, I'm not going to, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, fancy and advanced features by now because it's been a few years that we've been working on the, on the product. For example, I just mentioned a few. We uh, have XML support, we can parse XML, validate it, use um, XPath expressions. Uh, more security is persistent, which means you can store some information and retrieve, retrieve it later. We can identify uh, uh, sessions. Um, so you can, you, can, you can have per session storage, you can have per user account storage, uh, and can, you, you, you can do also this, these things. And basically, uh, in my, I think that most people are today are not using more security to the, to, uh, anywhere near to its fullest capacity. I know that few are, though. Um, just to some get, to give you an idea of what, uh, what we're talking about, I'm going to, um, on this slide, I'm going to show you a few rules. Um, the first rule here, I, ha I have three groups, which is very simple. Then another group with different operators and something that's a bit interesting. In a very simple rule, you just look for pattern anywhere in your uh, arguments. But um, in the second line, this is a separate rule that allows you to, to look for a pattern in all your arguments but you can omit one particular argument. So in this example, argument P will not be inspected. Um, so this is a, a simply applying a regular expression against your traffic, and that's something that we are all used to. However, we don't we support more than regular expressions. So in, in the second example, we have a different what we call operator. So instead of regular expression, we do something else. We can take all the input parameters and make sure that only bytes 10, 30, and the range from 32 to 126 appear in, in the parameter. Then in the th third rule, we actually have a real-time blocking list to which we can talk to. So we can take the remote address of the user and send it to the real-time blocking list and ask the list whether we, we should allow this user to proceed or not. So that's something, uh, that, that would be a negative security model. You look at the traffic and you know, search for the bad things. Here we have a very simple example of positive security model. Something I haven't said is before is virtual patching. And most security is especially well suited for virtual patching because in virtual patching is probably the only case where you can write a positive security model by hand and write it well. This is because this is usually a very simple task and this is a perfect, perfect example. This could be a virtual patch for a problem in an application and you can see that there are only three rules. So this is very easy to write. The first rule here, we actually count, uh, this operator we use for counting, we count the number of parameters that we have in the page, and we only allow one parameter. So that's one, um, one rule. In the second rule, we actually look at the names of all, all parameters, and we only allow, so we only allow one parameter, and that one parameter must be named start ID. And in the third step, we look at the start ID parameter and we make sure that it's a number, that uh, there's, it, it can contain only uh, up to three digits, so uh, anywhere from one to three digits. So you can see with the policy security model, we sort of lock the application down. So we say this script can only have one parameter, it must be named such and such, and it must be a number. And now we don't really care about all these other types of targeting out there because we will know that uh, we're sorted. And to finish with more security, at the moment we have four components consisting of the entire ecosystem. We have more security itself, 
We have the core rules, which is something that's bundled towards security. It's a negative, uh, based on negative security, something to deploy straight away. We have the free, the free community console, which is a GUI that allows you to monitor your own security instances. And we have the community. And I feel the most important part of most security is actually the community. And what we're doing now, and what this presentation is about, we're adding a fifth component, which is, which is more profiler. And it's basically adding the only big missing piece to more security, which is the alternative creation um, of uh, uh, a post security model. So how do we do it? And it's actually very simple. It's something that you would probably uh, think of if you were to approach the problem. We simply monitor, monitor the inbound traffic. And we uh, look at every request, we break it down to various pieces, and uh, we then take a look at uh, a, a few more requests, and we essentially build a model, a statistical model of each application as we're doing that. And then, uh, uh, we, uh, after we do that, we're able to verify uh, such requests in the future. Um, so things that we look uh, is uh, uh, look for is exactly the example I had before. Uh, parameter names, parameter types. How many times uh, can parameter appear uh, in a request? Uh, what is what is what are the characters that can appear in each parameter? Um, uh, which is the order in which parameters appear, and so on and so forth. So there, there, uh, uh, we're not looking in the current implementation. We're not looking for all of these, but there's probably 10 or 15 different characteristics and types that we can look for. Um, uh, in, uh, in, in every parameter. Um, and it's really, here's what, here's what we, this is not a, a screenshot of uh, my profile, but it, this is a screenshot that uh, relates the concept. After a, a profile is built, you have your size structure, so you can see all the things there, and you basically have a list of all parameters, and for each of these parameters, you, you know the type, you know, you know the content. And this actually was helping you uh, uh, improve security. So our goals for mod profiler were portability, partial model support, real life usefulness, and ease of use. Um, and just to address portability, we want to protect any web application out there. Uh, so that, that's an easy one. Partial model support is that uh, accepting that our models are never going to be perfect. You're always going to have, if you think about your application, you're always going to have some parts that are frequent to use, some parts that are less frequent. And uh, the, the ones that are often used, you will be able to protect them pretty well. But there are always going to be a few pages that people seldom visit. And for that, we're going to have a very small sample of the information. And then that's why we have to accept that, that uh, we've introduced a parameter called confidence. And for any particular information, we have confidence that say, yes, we know what we're talking about, and we're quite sure this model here is uh, very good. So uh, we propagate this parameter and make it available to the user so they can make decisions. If the confidence is 100%, they can choose to block. If the top, go ahead. Yes. So I, I apologize, but they could keep it, I guess, the basic point. When you're profiling, what kind of information do you gather and what do you generate with the results? Basically, your, your um, the, the type of information that we get, we get the resource name, we get uh, all the names, of, I, I mentioned that before, the names of the parameters, um, uh, and then we analyze that, the content of each parameter, and then we analyze that, and then we deduct the model out of it. Now, there, there are two things. One thing is that, uh, uh, what we implement right now, and the, the second thing is what we want to implement. Uh, the model is in the end is of the most security? Yes. Oh, okay. We have two. What we, what we end up doing is, I've always been a bit of an uh, uh, idealist, and what we ended up doing, we ended up creating an XML, XML model that's completely independent of mod security. And that's because if you generate more security rules, they're not really, uh, it's, some, it's uh, similar to Perl. If you write Perl, it's very, I mean, you know that it's very easy to write, but if you want to understand what you wrote after uh, a month or two, it's very difficult to go back and understand it. And it's similar to most security rules and enforcing security. Um, it's easy to write them, but if you want to modify it, it's not as easy. So we, what we ended up doing, we actually have an XML model, and I'll, I'll just um, show you an example of that. 
I've uh, increased the funds that you can see it. So what we ended up yeah. having is that something that's completely independent of our security. It takes them out, which basically allows you to do it and manipulate it by hand, or you can have a virtual tool, where we will eventually have it. So it's, it's pretty much the same thing. You have a resource, and you have the name of the resource there, which is basically the script. Um, here's the confidence parameter of this percent. In this case, it's 23%. So that's the that's information you can use for, uh, for making decisions what to do. And then we really evaluate and enumerate all the parameters. This script here changes passwords in an application. And then you get your um, old password. And so, so here, this is what we have at the moment. Uh, in the moment, we get the cardinality of the parameters. So you can see that old password doesn't have to appear in the script, but it can. We know the length. So the length is from 6 to 13 characters. And we have some idea about the content. I mean, you can't see the, the entire regular expression there. But then we have some idea about what can appear as a password in the content. And so you can see that we have three different uh, attitudes that we're using right now. And what we're doing is we're extending that into, into more. Go ahead. If uh, it's rejected the rule uh, to deny uh, uh, forbidden, mm -hmm. if you doesn't apply to the rules, but that's what didn't pay? Uh, it's up to you. Uh, it, it really depends. Mod profile does not force any particular policy, uh, but it gives you, it will tell you, uh, I've identified this many anomalies. Uh, for each of these anomalies, there's a certain confidence assigned to them, so you can look at that, and, 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 uh, and then you can, you can look at it and discover what type of certain anomalies are. So for example, some of the anomalies are, is that if we see a resource that hasn't been seen before, so that's, that, that's one type. The, the other type, we can see a parameter that we haven't seen before. You can, if, within a parameter, it can appear, say, more than, it, than, than we've seen. If, if we have a parameter, it can appear only once, but we see it twice in the request. That's another type of anomaly. So uh, we have a sort of anomaly scoring, which is combined. So we give you access to the entire score, but also to individual values. So in the end, what you do, you run, get more profile to run the tools, and then you can look into the results and decide the subject. So, um, and the ease of use, as now I mentioned that we've uh, uh, ended up with a model storage format in XML, the ease of use is actually, we wanted to allow people to uh, write tools by hand, uh, write models by hand. Uh, these are the basic building blocks. Uh, once you look at the application, you start from the top and you, you kind of drill down. We've identified the following uh, uh, entities. Uh, applications consist of resources. Each resource was, uh, can have one or multiple, or multiple uh, many behaviors. What we realize is that uh, many people have this inter sort of style of developing applications where they actually don't have one script to do one thing. But actually, uh, they have a script that will do maybe five things, but that will so sort of have a command app parameter. And based on the command parameter, they will internally dispatch the request to the some internal implementation. So when you look from the outside, it looks like it's one resource, but internally, oh, it's actually multiple resources, and the catch is that each of these internal resources has a different behavior. So if you try to, uh, to force and uh, create a model just of the resource, then you end up with a really bad model, but if you're, if you're able to identify these individual behaviors, then each individual model is going to be very tough. So and then you drill down into parameters, and then you drill down into parameter attributes. And we've identified maybe 10 to 15 different parameter attributes. And now the challenge for us is going to be identify which of these are actually uh, going to be worth implementing and worth enforcing. Because you can think of various ways how to restrict application security models, but it doesn't mean that they're all going to, uh, to work. On this page you have, now, uh, there's a bit of research about positive security out there. The problem is that in most cases the research doesn't really go into real life problems. And once you start to implement things, you encounter real life, real life problems. And that's actually where you spend most of your time. On this page you can see some of the examples. Um, some websites will have information embedded in URLs. And that's not only preventing you from building a model to identify the real resource, but you actually yeah, sometimes can you need to look at the data. Here we have the ISBN number embedded in the URL itself. So you have to have support to extract that information out there. Um, then you have uh, resource aliases, um, where one URL is actually completely uh, points internally to something completely different. 
Then you have what I previously mentioned is that if you have a special parameter with additional command internally, that, um, that will process differently. So a different value will actually have the different behavior. And then you have uh, uh, some pathological cases with applications just inventing in dynamic generating parameters in real time. And actually, we've in the meantime, we've discovered a lot of these and that we're going to, uh, we're, we're handling that. And this is where it became, became really interesting for me. At this point, by the way, um, uh, you really have to go to the Mod Profiler website because we have a white paper. It's a really nice white paper that specifies this XML format. And it, what's, what's really exciting for me is that uh, this white paper is not specific to web application models <coughs> at all. And uh, I, I named the white paper enough with default, default allow in web applications. And I think this points to a fundamental flaw that we have in the way we're deploying web applications today, is that web servers will accept any request that you send to them, and then they will take any request and pass it on to the web application. In reality, web applications only handle a very small subset, and the problem is that uh, developers, they don't really know, understand security, um, and they don't really know how to handle all these different request parameters with different uh, content encodings and so on and so forth. So what I'd really like to see is applications being deployed locked down from the beginning with these positive security models. And I want to see a contract between a web application and the outside world. And I want to see a web application say, these are the entry points that I accept. For each of these entry points, entry points these are the allowed parameters. and then you instruct the web server or a web application file, look at this contract and enforce it. And that way what we're doing, and I think this is the whole point of more profile, if you take a look at your attack surface, and most web applications are completely open. With a post security model, what you do, you create a shield around your application and you close that. So if you have a wall, you just close and cover the surface and you just open the small bits where input is allowed. And then after all, uh, this allows us actually to do is uh, solve entire classes of vulnerabilities. So um, the XML format, which I mentioned, it can be used in a number of ways. It can be used for virtual patching. Uh, applications can actually, you can create a virtual patch for one specific vulnerability. We can have developers develop uh, models during development and then deliver it uh, with the application so that it, it, we, we cannot be protected from scratch. People can actually exchange their models. If you think about it, many sites will have very low uh, traffic, so they don't actually, um, uh, they, they, it will be difficult for them to create positive security models. But you, if you take popular open source products, you can actually copy models from one inst installation to another, and that way uh, people can actually collaborate to build models, which I find particularly, uh, particularly exciting. Anyway, uh, the way we're doing more profile at the moment is the Java application, we instruct MoSQL to, to log, we log the entire traffic stream and we run it through Mod Profiler. Mod Profiler goes, reads every uh, in, uh, transaction, breaks it down, looks into individual parameters and starts to build a model. In the end, we output two files. One is the XML file, which is very readable, the other is a MoSQL uh, rules file, which you can take and you can plug it right there. Uh, this is a sort of incremental process. Because we made Mod Profile a bit uh, smart in the, the, the first time you had to have full traffic loading on. But then once you start to build a model, Mod Profiler will uh, uh, force logging of traffic where confidence is low. But if, if there's, a part, if there's a part of site where, where we have confidence of 100%, we will not log there anymore. So what you do in the, in, uh, over time, you can run this uh, process in several batches and the model will be refined, uh, refined over, over time. We're taking advantage of uh, more security in filtering the negative uh, traffic because uh, your model is only going to be as good, or very good, if you don't include a tax into it. But if you, if you take a sample of your site, you're bound to be including a, a, a bunch of attacks as well. So what we do first, we will apply a negative security model and then we will exclude transactions that we find suspicious. We will probably perform a bit of uh, uh, further exclusion as well. So you don't want to include four or fours and another anomalous request. And then we end up what we think is a, is a sample that doesn't include any attacks. And that's, uh, using that sample, we can, uh, we can build a model. 
Um, I'll explain it so it's a bit easier. Uh, we have a mock graph built in Java at the moment because we, this is a journey when we need to find out what is the best algorithm. And um, in what we're doing is essentially prototyping. Although mock graph is perfectly useful, it's not a real time tool. Once we figure out the, the algorithm, we may eventually uh, migrate and build that into more security itself. And I'm going to leave some time for questions. I want to make some conclusions here. And I'm going to, I want to look at, at, at the crux of the matter is what is the, the what are the things that we can protect from? Well, we can protect from information leakage. Things such as uh, source code, backup files, uh, archives that are left by mistake on sites, and uh, files that you don't know are there. Uh, if your model doesn't include it, and if you enforce the model, such files are never going to be saved by the web server. That is increasing the depth surface. Um, just by accepting only the request methods that you want to accept, and if you know the support, in most applications, those will be get, post, and had. You, we are going to reduce the depth surface. You do the same for code and encodings. For example, if your application is never uploading anything, then you don't want to support multi-platform data. And incidentally, multi-platform uh, data is a complex encoding, and many applications have problems uh, supporting it properly. And there are, there are many cases they will be boxing. So just by not accepting anything there by default, you enhance your security. Deeper, deeper parameters. Developers often leave special parameters in the source code, so when you, if you know about them and if you use them, you get more information about the application. In our case, because debug parameters are not going to be in our model, we can follow, we cannot allow them. Uh, we can prevent injection in some cases, and we can be very secure, sure that we're preventing. So if you have numbers, it's very easy to ensure the parameters are numbers. Um, in some other cases where you have the input is a string, I can't say that we can be 100% certain of preventing injection, but we can, see, uh, we can um, mitigate that. Because what we're doing is essentially uh, input validation. Input validation cannot prevent injection, only output uh, encoding can. But because input validation which fix the character set that is used in parameters, it makes injection more difficult. So depending on how well we do in assigning content and verifying content that's in our model, um, then we, uh, we can, we can uh, solve the injection problem as well. Um, so where we're here with one profile right now, it's out there and it works. I've deployed it. Uh, I have a site um, with, what, I have a recording of one million transactions on the site. I run one profile using that. It works very well for my case. Uh, I don't have any false voices, um, uh, and uh, the, the, we're, I'm at that point, we're at that point that uh, we need to move and test a monographer profile with a wide range of different sites that look uh, completely differently, and then we need to uh, find and eliminate the age cases. And this is where we need to uh, involve the community. I've already reached out to some of the very popular open source projects. And I've uh, uh, received pledges of some of them that will give us full access to their traffic. And we are going to try to do that thing where you take a huge open source project, build a policy security model for it, and then let them develop it, download and use it. And one thing that we will not support in a moment, but we will, is continuous learning, where we update the model as uh, application actually uh, evolves. Long term, it's uh, actually more exciting long term. And, um, I have this philosophy that it's not important where you are, but it's important that you continue to improve yourself. And you know, if you asked me uh, five years ago what I thought well, it, it would become about security, I'm not sure I would say that uh, it would amount to much. But because we've invested continuous effort over the years, more security is now a very uh, popular uh, uh, product. So uh, the future of what we is we don't want to limit ourselves to input modeling. We want to do an output modeling as well, so where we look at response, responses. We want to do user profiling, procession profiling. We want to extend data coverage to 100 days in XML. And then we eventually want to move to real time uh, operation. <coughs> Okay, that's about it. We've run out of time, and I'll take any questions. Yes, sir. PCI DSS, <coughs> will it be approved as a WAF for PCI DSS? 
as far as I'm aware, PCI is not occurring any much in the moment. When, when I go to an audit, would any uh -huh. auditor that's approved by PCI, will they accept this? You can give PCI, I want to section in PCI, so I either have a security auditor go over the source code or have a work in place. I will tell you that they will accept more security. Um, because I, have, I, I know of cases, but they haven't made any official statement. But more security, and I think that the, the whole issue with PCI, uh, any web application file can do the job, for as long as it's properly installed and maintained. You can't really just put the box and say, okay, yes, I, I've, I've done it. Uh, I think that the whole point of PCI is that you have to um, install it, maintain the rule set, observe what's happening, and then you'll be fine. And then, of course, you have to block which I don't necessarily agree with, uh, with the council, but uh, that's, that's their view. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. First, uh, uh, you, can, you can have a perfectly valid parameter and still have a translation. Use a different name that is valid in the system. And, uh, if you bypass the access control, then, then the parameter is not the, 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 the thing that we're talking about. The second question is, I assume that, that this is between the uh, client and the application, but not between the application and the database, right? Uh -huh. So the database is still exposed. Uh, if, it can, uh, if it can be accessed directly, then yes, certainly. The third question is, uh, <coughs> if you can say anything about the learning algorithm, and the fourth question is, if you can provide any statistics about the fourth position and the fourth minute. Uh, okay, so the, the, the first thing is to say is about access control. Uh, I don't think that this can do any class of control. Maybe if we go into user profiling, where we actually profile each individual user account separately, and then we see which resources it can access, and if, you, and if we see which, uh, which values can certain parameters have, then we might be able to address access control. But at this point, we cannot only address injection. Um, uh, the third is uh, about the false positive rate. In my, uh, all, in my cases that I have, um, I didn't have any false positives, but there's the advantage because I had a huge data set. So I don't have any real live data at this point to give you a, a better understanding of uh, uh, the false net positives versus false negatives. What I'll have to do is I'll have to reach out to the user base, so I'll have to test to that. Last question, please. Okay, go ahead. The input of the quad profiler is the law of what security yes. in the output is the rules of the yes. quad profiler. Uh, of the quad security as well. Okay. And this process, you need to keep the flow for, let's say, one week, depending on the traffic, and the flow of the traffic. As much, uh, basically, the question is how much you get traffic, and how long do you, do, you, do you record the traffic for? You can record for as long as you can. That's the and you have to have more security deployed with the negative security rules and then you can move the, the detects from the, the sample. I, I agree, I mean, I'm not saying that it's perfect. If it, if it was, was, was perfect, we would have a security model, but that's the, that's the general idea. We also do some internal filtering, but we haven't really worked on that much. Thank you very much.